Okay, welcome all. Thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Rebecca Deutscher and I'm a senior research associate at CSET. Um, today we're going to learn more about the work of our CSET UL colleague, Sofia Gonzalez Otero. Um, she just completed her PhD in equity and innovation in education from the University of A. Coruna in Spain. And Sofia defended her dissertation just a few weeks ago and today she'll be sharing some of this work with us. Um, first, to just give you a little background on her talk, um, um, populations of English language learners are complex and heterogeneous, and their linguistic skills are commonly underestimated. Sophia's dissertation focused on presenting new alternatives to achieve equitable treatment of linguistic diversity. She will discuss how the performance of ELL students varies across languages when they are tested in English and their first language evaluating reading comprehension and different types of inferential questions related to various short narrative texts. Let's welcome Sophia. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm gonna uh -huh. share my screen to start the presentation. You see it? Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this presentation. In this talk, I'm going to summarize the research work that I recently presented as my PhD thesis, which was developed as a collaboration between Stanford University and the University of A Coruña in Spain. I will present a new model that allows to reach a high quality in the development of comparable tests in different languages. In this case, I have applied to English and Spanish to assess inferential reading skills in these languages. The presentation will follow this agenda. In the first place, I will explain the specific context of this research study. Next, the goals of this research. Then I will summarize the conceptual framework and the empirical approach that I use. Finally, I will talk about the findings and conclusions of this work. As a part of this uh, introduction, I will explain the context of this work. This study was conducted in the state of California in English language learners. These English language learners are part of a population classified as newcomers to the US, refugee students, internationally adopted children, etc. In this scenario, there is a special concern for providing solutions to the Spanish speaking population and the immigrant population. Because English is not the only mother tongue of the population living in the United States. And also because English language learners is a heterogeneous population. That is why it is necessary to pay attention to this composition of elements and what they entail when developing tests. Next, I will show some maps on the population and linguistic diversity in California and the rest of the states in the United States. In this map, you can see the Hispanic population concentrated in the Southwest. This research has been developed in California because it was an ideal place due to its concentration of Hispanic population. This map is important because it shows the areas or states with highest concentration of Hispanic population, as in this case, the Southwestern United States. In this figure, you can see the most widely spoken languages in the US. Spanish is one of the most widely spoken languages with 62% follow by Chinese, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. This graph is important because it shows the heterogeneity of languages and which are the predominant languages. This map shows the generic names used to refer to soft drinks. In blue, we see that the most used term is pop in the north. In red, we see that the most used term is coke in the south central USA. In yellow, we see that the most used term is soda in the Western US, and in green, violet, the regions where terms were uh, used other than the previous ones. It is important to note that in the dominant language, such as English, 
we were seeing different terms to refer to soft drinks. When it comes to developing tests in two languages, the complexity increases due to this linguistic diversity. That is why a key aspect to consider is the context of the population being assessed. When assessing bilinguals, the complexity increases because they are navigating between multiple languages. After some preliminary analysis, I have seen a gap in the field of test design and specifically for assessing inferential reading comprehension in English language learners. This research is important because of lack of proficiency in the English language. The tests used so far are standardized, developed from a monolingual perspective, and the reading comprehension tests used are not contextualized. Therefore, it is necessary to advance in this field of test design. Now I'm going to talk about the goals of this research study. Taking into account the needs in this field, this research study aimed to assess inferential reading skills in elementary school students who attend a Spanish immersion program associated with a specific context. This research is proposed with the purpose of contribute for social and educational interventions in the field of the design of tests, which involve the bilingual population that studies at least a second language. More specific goals are to assess inferential reading skills in students who attend the Spanish immersion program, to assess inferential reading skills using a logical model for the development of tests in students who attend the Spanish immersion program, and to examine sources of score variations such as student question dimension, language, writer, and text of the group that attends this Spanish immersion program. After explaining the context of the research, the needs and goals, I will present the conceptual framework of this work. Next, I will talk about the language perspectives, bilingualism, reading comprehension, testing in English language learners. This graph shows two, two language perspectives, the functional and the formal. Keep in mind that no perspective is exclusive and no language perspective is better than another. From a functional perspective, language is understood as a process when its role is the means for understanding, as a system when the role of language is used as a resource of the construction of knowledge. From a formal perspective, language is understood as a structure when its role focuses on the organization of the text, vocabulary, complexity of the text, and factor when the role of language is understood as the control and achievement of measures. If we focus in the area of testing English language learners, language can be understood under two dimensions, from a deterministic perspective and also from a probabilistic perspective. According to this positioning, the practices carried out in the testing field will mark the academic performance of the students. To assess the performance of the students, it can be examined from a deterministic point of view where the perspective of the linguistic groups are seen as homogeneous, with few performance categories where cada academic contexts are clearly distinguishable. From a probabilistic perspective, groups are understood as heterogeneous, where social contexts are diffuse, poorly defined, and largely unknown. This work focuses on taking this probabilistic perspective into account, also considering a broad set of aspects of language. Having pointed out the different perspective of language at a general level, and specifically in the area of the testing language, learn language learners, I will explain the concept of bilingualism, its typology, and finally, the acquisition and use of language. Despite the difficulty in finding a concept of to define bilingualism, I will refer bilingual when navigating in at least two languages. According 
to Crossyang, the bilingual is not two monolinguals in one person. According to Romain, bilingualism must be observed from a broader point of view, including the cognitive, social, and cultural dimensions. Currently, and from a psycholinguistic position, bilingualism is understood as a continuum in which different linguistic areas of the bilingual can exhibit different organizations and levels of psycholinguistic development. There is a wide typology of bilingualism. Here I summarize the most relevant types of bilingualism, coordinated at and compound bilingualism, complete or incomplete bilingualism, additive or subtractive bilingualism, and equal or unequal bilingualism. Linguists and psychologists have been concerned with characterizing the types of bilingualism using criteria such as the age at which bilingual acquisition arises, the sequence of acquisition of the two languages, the way in which the bilingual uses the two languages, the organization of the two languages of the bilingual, the linguistic competence, and the psychosocial context of the bilingual acquisition. This typology shows how bilinguals are not identical to monolinguals. The fundamental factor of bilingual representation is the weaker links that are established within the network because of less frequent use of each language. When we speak of language acquisition and use, bilinguals have weak links in linguistic system due to the less frequent use of each language. Furthermore, bilinguals are aware that the morphosyntactic resources they have stored from their verbal production are different between these languages. Now, I will explain the main research focus of this work, which is reading comprehension. Among the experts, does not seem to be an agreement to find a definition of what we understand by reading comprehension. There are a variety of descriptions related to reading comprehension. I'm going to offer two of them, and they are adapted to the object of this study. According to Rosenblatt, Reading comprehension is a process of extraction and construction of meaning be between previous knowledge and the text in a context. Ramon Hart affirms that in the course of construction of reading comprehension, a process product of the interaction of three elements, the context, the cognitive schemes, and the text. That is, the readers the text and the context are part of the same system where they condition each other and are interdependent in a process that is open and dynamic. There are more than five levels of reading comprehension, but here I will only explain that of inferential comprehension, which is the one that concerns us in this study. Inferential comprehension, it is the third level according to Soriya's classification, where the reader relates the information in the text with her his personal experience and makes conclusions and hypotheses. Bunch plays the inference from a philosophical and formal logic perspective in the internal laws of transit between the premises and the conclusions, therefore, following the logical loss of validity and truth. In argumentative logic, one can speak of valid and invalid inferences. Therefore, inferences have a mathematical aspect that is important to consider for the development of educational tests, and specifically when we elaborate narrative texts and their subsequent questions, since all elements of the text, like words with their meanings, among others, are related. In reading comprehension, several variables converge, such as the social linguistic, extra linguistic, and educational context, the reading process, strategies, reading skills, reader schemes, memory, among others. 
Among the great variety of components, these that appear in light blue are the four of interest in this work. Text, images, contextual variables, and vocabulary and tests. When we assess English language learners, certain considerations must be taken into account. A person's level of proficiency in a language is determined by the context in which the language is used. The extraction of conclusion are different about the reading skills in students depending on whether monolingual or bilingual approaches are used in the interpretation of performance. This figure, the language proficiency patterns of monolingual person, case A, and five monolingual people, case B, C, D, E, F, in the four linguistic modalities in each language, represented with the letters L, listening, S, speaking, R, reading, and W, writing. Each column, represented by the color pink and blue, refers to a different language. In case A, the monolingual student has a 100% proficiency in all skills. And in case B, the bilingual student is fully proficient of both language and all skills. These are unrealistic cases of the proficiency of the four linguistic modalities in the languages. The rest of the cases, C, D, E, and F show heterogeneous proficiency of the language in all language modalities in each language. That is, bilingual students exhibit different strengths and weaknesses in the different language modalities in each language. Now I'm going to explain the empirical framework. The sections of the empirical framework are going to be school context, sample selection, data collection, design and methods, analysis of comparability, tests, administration, coding, and data analysis. I conducted the research study in a public school where there um, is a Spanish immersion program and students receive instruction in Spanish and English. In kindergarten, 90% of the instruction is in Spanish, while 10% is in English. English instruction increases every grade level until reaching equal percentages by fifth grade. I selected a sample taking into account the following criteria. The program to which students were assigned, the grade in which students were enrolled, the home language survey. Finally, I selected the grades third and fourth because they had a greater number of students in the Spanish immersion program. The students have different socioeconomic status despite the fact that the school is located in a high socioeconomic context. I've sent consent letters in English and Spanish to the families of the students who were involved in the study. This table shows the consent received by grade, and I uh, got a total of uh, 45 consents. For this study, the discursive, discursive genre use was the narrative text. The narrative text represents or tells a story that happened to different characters, real or fictitious, in a certain period of time and the causal relationships between them. If we compare it uh, with other texts, narratives make possible the elaboration of a great variety of inferences, since they demand an understanding that requires generating a situation model. The materials that I developed in this study were two narrative texts with two different themes and with the titles that correspond to the crayon and the ball. I also developed two versions of these texts, one in Spanish 
and one in English. These texts have been prepared based on the linguistic, conceptual, and psychometric properties of the text, taking into account their comparability. That is, the two texts have two different themes, but the structure is similar. The themes or content of the texts were selected according to the school experiences that the students normally have in their educational context. One of the innovative elements of this research work is that so far no comparable uh, tests have been developed. When we develop tests, this control of psychometric complexity is not taken into account. In this influence, the testing of competence in languages. We can see here la pelota in Spanish and the ball in English, where are comparable. I have generated six questions, each of which is based on a different type of inference time, place, feeling, cause effect, problem solving. You can see an example of this comparability between questions for both crayon and ball. O el crayon o la pelota. Advocate from Blum's theory, which assumes different processes or cognitive dimensions organized from the simplest, such as remembering knowledge, to the most complex, how to make judgments about the ideas. In addition, Barrett's taxonomy that conceives reading as a set of dimensions characterized by certain skills, knowing the meaning of words, formulating inferences, obtaining the author's purpose. To carry out this comparability between narrative texts, I use the Stanford Core LP software, which allows to visualize using a color code the different types of words in each text. You can also see the number of sentences for each text. And here is an example of the analysis of the test of the crayon in English. I use this software for uh, the Spanish version for all the texts. In addition, I have analyzed the level of readability of text, el crayon en la pelota, in both languages, in order to know if the texts are uh, adapted to the selected courses. This slide shows the readability levels results for the crayon and the ball in English. Different formulas have been used to measure the readability of text and refer to what is considered the limit between normal and what is difficult to read. The level of the readability obtained for uh, the crayon and the ball text was adequate for the third and fourth year grades. For the development of this text, a conceptual model based on what is called unified modeling language has been used. One of the innovative elements of this research is that so far no logic model has been developed for the development of tests. When tests are built, this control of psychometric complicity is not taken into account and this influenced the testing of proficiency in languages. As you can see in the model, the text is composed of paragraphs. The paragraphs are composed of sentences, each of which has associated actions and facts that can be of any topic. The factors are related to the types of inferences that are drawn from the narrative text. The task component model represents that the text is composed of different types of inferences, 
both story one and story two have the same number of paragraph sentences and actions. In addition, the sequences of inferential factors are parallel to time, place, feeling, attitude, cause effect, and problem solving, as well as the contextual, gender, and format characteristics. As for the identical inferential tasks, they are similar for both texts. The ball and the crime. This table shows an example of the linguistic complexity of the each narrative text, the crime in English and Spanish, and ball in English and Spanish. For the administration of the tests, an introduction and permission script has been used for text divided into two sessions for each student and four sequences in which the students were randomly assigned. The design chosen for the administration of the test was experimental design within a subject. All students were exposed to the same conditions. That is, the same tests were administered to all of them in two sessions and on the same days. This design makes it possible to have a control of the variables. That is, the administration times and conditions are the same for all students. This table shows the sequences used to administer the test to students. The four basic sequences are highlighted and repeated through the rest of the table. In each session, each student received two tests on a different topic and language. Students were randomly assigned to the generated second list. For scoring the answers, uh, two writers score these answers. These writers participate in two phases, the training phase and the scoring phase. Those writers use three rubrics assessing the dimension of elaboration, alignment, and correspondence between languages. Here is an example of the rubrics used to assess the answer according to the dimensions of alignment, elaboration, and correspondence between languages. For the alignment dimensions, students are assessed based on whether they responded in relation to the author's intention. In each rubric, you can see some examples of answers according to the level of alignment. We see an example of a response in the pink box that corresponds to level one, where the student does not answer the question according to the author's intention. For the elaboration dimension, it was assessed how the answer is, um, is structurally elaborated regardless of the author's intention we see an example of a response in the pink box that is structurally elaborated with the highest value being three. For the dimension of correspondence, it is assessed whether the language of the question corresponds with the answer given by the student. And we can see an example of level three where the answer corresponds to the same language of the question. In this study, I did four analyses, frequency distribution analysis, analysis of statistical descriptors, analysis of variance with repeated measures between students, and variance component analysis. And finally, I go to explain the findings of this study. What I found is the performance of students is more similar between languages than between different aspects of reading comprehension. The performance of the students was substantially sensitive to the content of the stories and the aspects of reading comprehension evaluated by the questions. At the individual level, the performance of the student was influenced by the convergence of reading skills, the aspect of reading, the task, and the language in which the tasks were administered. 
And as a conclusion of this work, the main conclusion of this work is that the use of a logic model allows reaching a high quality in the development of comparable tests, as well as a high precision in the evaluation of academic achievement of inferential reading ability in bilingual students. In summary, this work helps to develop tests that are more fair, and it is a big step towards offering the same opportunities to bilingual students. And if you have any questions, or if you want to know more about this study, please contact me on this email. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for attending this presentation. And also I want to thank you, my PhD advisor, Professor Pilar Couto Cantero from the University of A Coruña, and Professor Guillermo Solano Flores from Stanford University. This work wouldn't have been possible without their support. And advice. Thank you so much. And at this point in time, if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, we welcome uh, you to ask them now. Thanks, Sophia, for sharing your um, study with us. I, I'm i curious, though, I, my question is around, um, what was the most surprising thing that you found when you were doing the study? The most surprised thing is that uh, having even a, a standardized text, I got different answers that are having this, the good score, the, the, the maximum score for the, the, the same, the same different answers for the same question. So the variety of the answers are incredible. This is the, 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 the one thing that uh, surprised me. The understanding of the students is different in each question, but the answer is correct. Thanks, um, Sophia, for uh, sharing your presentation. Uh, I know you put in a lot of work for this, so congratulations once again. Uh, my question was on uh, the use of rubrics. And you, it's also to piggyback on what you said for the variety of responses. Do you think it's possible to have a rubric which can capture uh, the sort of variety? Because I know you were looking at certain aspects of language you're using Barry's framework and the other things, the aspects of reading comprehension you're looking at. But do you think one rubric could capture you all the variety? I mean, what were your challenges in that aspect? Rubrics and... For me, the use of rubrics, you have to train the writers very well. What I got from uh, my study is the tray of uh, the uh, writers uh, had the same scores for every student. It means that the training that they received, it was very good. So they trained very well using these rubrics. And we and I didn't got any variety between writers. This is the one thing that I was analyzing too. So if you do a very good training with these rubrics and the writers is the most important thing. Well, we know that <laughs> that we analyze a lot of yeah. things. Yeah, I know, but I was just wondering about the creation of the rubric itself. How mm -hmm. well was could you do that? And I agree with the training of the writers, but the creation of the rubric itself. Were you yeah, you have to you have to adjust the rubric. Okay, uh, and make adjustments based on the, the training and also the answers that you are seeing, you have to be very careful with that. If you wanna, um, the thing is the proficiency 
when we are uh, getting, giving a grade, you know, to a student. Here, uh, all students, even if they have or had a different answer in a question, we got a, a grade that is fine, you know? Mm -hmm. You cannot uh, grade or undervalue a kid because oh, you don't know uh, his or her context. You have to be very careful when you are uh, assessing the reading comprehension because probably the answer is good. So I don't see that uh, happening in the schools when they are grading kids. Because of the cultural thing, most of the teachers probably, they, they don't know. They don't know the, the cultural aspects and they are like saying like, okay, this answer is not good. That's why I was elaborating three rubrics. One is elaboration, alignment, and correspondence between languages. Did you see any difference based on the students' abilities also? There was no difference in how they performed? No. Between rubrics, no. And this is a, a thing that uh, also surprised me because um, I got similar uh, scores for the three rubrics in each answer, I mean. And Okay, and so they were, so from I'm just trying to um, sort of clarify your study. So they were asked to read this, and you gave them similar prompts for them to answer. Isn't that what you did? And then you used a rubric to evaluate the answers, the student answers. Yeah, I gave uh, them uh -huh. uh, the four texts yeah. in English and Spanish, and the six questions about time, location, problem solving. Mm -hmm. And after that, I uh, the writers assessed mm -hmm. these answers based on the alignment, the elaboration, and the correspondence between languages. Okay. So they had to answer the similar questions both in English and Spanish every day. Yes. Mm -hmm. so did you see if there was any difference in based on the students proficiency in English or Spanish, how they responded in English or Spanish? No, because they were all bilingual, isn't it? Yeah, all bilinguals. Okay. From different uh, languages. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Bye. Thank you so much. That was great to hear your talks. So I, I had a question. Is, was this at where you did the study? Is it, it was in the US or, yes. or was it, were you at multiple schools or was it one particular school that you were at here? Particular school because uh, the intention was to get the experiences from the context for developing these texts because I wanted to de uh, develop texts that are, uh, you know, contextualized. So I got information and evidence about the context of these kids in the school. Okay. What the thing that I see is that when you don't elaborate a contextual um, texts, essays, uh, you can, you are putting the kids in a situation that they couldn't understand the text because of the context. Imagine, imagine that you are not familiar with Galicia cultural uh, context. And I am, you are coming and the teacher put you in a assessment or test that you don't are, are you are not familiar with the context. We have many cultural things that nobody knows. So your reading comprehension is not gonna be, you know, at the high level. So I am not treating you in an equal way with others because you are not from there. So this is the thing that I try to show that you have to be very careful when we develop tests, we have to get this contextual information. 
and treat students equally, you know, giving the same opportunities than others. Reading comprehension is a, a difficult uh, construct to analyze and assess. Even for a daily life conversations, it's difficult, the reading comprehension. Most of the time we are uh, using inductive, uh, inductive inferential skill, and we are trying to assess deductive skill here, you know, the inferential skill here. So I'm wondering, like, I mean, it, it may be hard to speculate, but like, if you had designed this and we're doing this at a school back in Spain, like, how would you maybe, what are some things you might do differently? Or, because again, looking at the context and all that. First of all, uh, I would get information about the context because these texts are uh, <laughs> good for this context, that uh, right. for this school. So I could get uh, information from the context for sure to elaborate uh, the texts. Even Galicia, that we have many autonomies communities, uh, they also probably they talking away or use uh, words that we don't have. The cultural thing probably is different. I know that because the north of Galicia is a little bit different from the south. My region, we are using a language that nobody knows in the rest of Galicia. And I have words that nobody understands if I use them. So by experience, I have to say that uh, many things are involved in reading comprehension. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you, it. <laughs> Thank you. Pilar? Here I am. Hello. Hi, Pilar. <laughs> uh, well, the first thing is uh, congratulations, Sofia, Thank for you so your research. This is just a very, very, very small cog in a big wheel, as we all know, because it's a PhD and there's a lot of work behind this short and brief presentation. But I just, I just would like to say, as, as Rebecca asked about the, doing the same research in Spain or in other country, I, will, I would like just to say that this is the starting point in my personal view, and I think Sophia agrees, uh, to start uh, with assessment tests, which are uh, placed in the perspective of bilingual minds, not monolingual ones. So this is my first key word. Uh, use the plurilingualism even because as Sophia said in, in, in our region, in our country, in the Northwest, we, we, we have two mother tongues. So we share Spanish and Galician at the same level. And then we got the third or the fourth foreign language. So. <laughs> Plurilingualism is the second key concept that I would like to highlight. Of course, the context is really the key word as well. I totally agree with Sophia. We, we cannot just translate these um, tests to another country without, without taking into account all the context in, in, in different parts of the world because it's totally different. In this, in this place, the ball and the crayon was the key words for the children to, to talk about and to have uh, comments on that. But maybe in another place in the world, it will not be the ball, it will be another thing. So totally agree with the contest, which is another key word. And uh, I will also highlight uh, translanguaging, right? Because in, in the... Um, in the slides that uh, Sophia showed us, uh, we, I could very briefly, but I could read in use, using the Spanish and English at the same time. It, it was a, an answer about in the Mesa or something like that. I don't remember, but they were sharing both languages and translanguaging nowadays is a key concept uh, everywhere. And I think is a, a high level of uh, um, sophisticated linguistic cognition in my view 
And I think we have to take profit from that, not just using it in the on the contrary to say that children don't learn or they don't know, but the other way around. This is my personal opinion. So I think this, this research is very, very important because it's the, the starting point, as I said from in the beginning, to start uh, preparing different tests and assessment for bilingual or plurilingual minds, taking into account all these keywords that I mentioned. And I don't want to speak anymore because it's Sophia's uh, day. And congratulations very much because it's a very hard uh, work. And all the mistakes are mine. All the good things are from Sophia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Pilar. <laughs> Anybody else? Any question? I don't have a question, but I was just wondering how Marcos feels after all this, <laughs> after your dissertation. <laughs> I think he can jumping. Yeah, well, I guess I have to say something now. <laughs> so I feel I feel really happy uh, about this. This was a very long process that started already in Spain some years ago. Uh, so it was both at a, not just uh, at a research or work level, it was at a, a big, big personal challenge. So I just can say that uh, I feel very happy and I, I really want to say congrats, Sofia, because this work, I mean, I, from a researcher perspective, I'm not in that field, but I'm a different one. But I, I can understand some, some of it. And I think it's, it's a great job, great uh, research contribution and, and a, big, uh, a beginning of, of, of very uh, great things for the future. That's, that's what I can say. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Thank you so much, Marcos. Well, on behalf of the CSET team, I just wanted to say thank you to Sophia for this wonderful presentation. Um, and thanks for everyone uh, for joining and for attending. Uh, we did record this and I put the link to where we will be posting it um, once I get it ready and up onto our website. Um, but thank you so much, Sophia. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for your support, Rebecca and Javier. I, I know we are very busy, but thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. <laughs>